<laughs> you made me feel important. Well, hello. Hi. Hi. Really nice to be here. Thank you for um, hosting the event. Um, thanks. Okay, this way. Well, my name is Greg Frakos. Um, I live in the UK for the past 16 years. Um, I work in um, security, in cybersecurity. Um, I've done uh, a lot of work on um, trying to um, exploit systems from an ethical hacker's perspective, obviously. And um, I work for Invisec. Um, we're actually rebranding at the moment, so it used to be called Deep Recce. Um, and that's uh, me. The whole talk about today, I don't want any misunderstandings, is um, from a hacker's point perspective, from someone who's trying to exploit systems, the payment systems are becoming more and more available to them. The same way that um, expensive kit um, used to become very expensive for people to have their hands on them, now you can find them on eBay. So um, there are ways um, and there are little tricks that they can do in order to um, see them do some fraudulent activity, you, I, would, I think um, you should be aware of. Uh, more or less, uh, I'm going to start with the highlights for threat modeling, again, from how to think like a hacker when you have to deal with secure systems. And I believe that um, payment systems are supposed to be considered secure. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about point of sales, point of interaction devices, I'm going to mention a few things um, about locked and unlocked POI devices, um, tricks with POI, tricks with virtual terminals, and an outcome or the outcome of a threat modeling exercise, again, from the hacker's perspective. When a hacker gets their hands on one of these things, um, how they can think outside the box, basically. So, threat modeling. It's a process by which potential threats can be identified, enumerated, and prioritized, all from a hypothetical attacker's point of view. Again, um, the whole idea of this, I don't want to be misunderstood, is I'm trying to explain to you how to think outside the box when you're assessing systems, right? <coughs> um, there are multiple approaches to threat modeling. I have to mention that a WASP has a lot of um, um, documentations on threat modeling. We're probably doing threat modeling at the moment. Um, also, Safe Code, which is a not-profit organization as well. Uh, and basically, there are different approaches. For for example, software-centric threat modeling, security-threatening threat modeling, asset or risk-centric threat modeling. Um, you probably have heard of um, Stride, um, which is um, another approach to threat modeling, and also Tread. So you can find this information basically um, on the WASP website and um, all the details on how to do this. Um, performing threat modeling provides a far greater return than spending thousands of pounds to fraud control for a system that has negligible fraud risk. Make threat risk modeling an, an early priority in your application um, design process. Basically, think before someone else thinks how to exploit your systems. Um, so by having done this little introduction, to clarify things, I'm going to take you through a little journey about PAIM, uh, point of sales, so basically POIs, point of interaction devices. <clears throat> you have probably used one of them because everybody has a payment card, right? Um, so when you get your card in the post from the bank, um, they tell you to remember your PIN and because you need it for your transactions, and that you need to keep your pin safe so no one else can use your card. What I'm going to go through today is um, what, I've what I've done is I looked at the standard, I look at this process, and I try to say, okay, let's say that I, I'm playing around with it. What could I do? Can I basically um, do tricks? Can I do fraudulent activity um, against these machines? So before I start, I want to make sure that I put some assumptions in place. Um, I will not mention any uh, point of interaction manufacturers, and I will not mention basically um, which OS vendors I'm talking about, about the combination of them. So for obvious reasons, and one of them, because the talk is being streamed. <laughs> 
<coughs> yeah, I've changed a few things in the presentation. Um, then now, you have to promise me that after you've seen this talk, you will behave after the presentation, <laughs> right? Especially when you go down to the pub. Um, again, you have to um, basically, if you decide after the presentation to fly to Las Vegas, you have to take me with you and to pay for my ticket, right? Sure? No, no. Seriously? Right? Um, so, it seems to be getting easier by the day for fraudsters and cyber criminals to get their own hands on live and payment uh, systems. Um, and there are some attacks that are basically waiting to happen. And this is what basically this talk is about. To think outside the box to identify those threats, those attacks. Um, there are two types of pain of interaction devices. Um, the ones which are locked and the, which, the ones which are unlocked. The unlocked ones have no open ports. What, 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 what do we mean? Communication ports, to communicate with another device. Um, they are standalone. Um, the locked ones do have one open port, however. So it's those devices that you see when there is like a till and the till communicates with a cable with the device and the cashier needs to um, type in the amount and the, then the device unlocks and expects you to put your card in to pay. The lock point of interaction devices is controlled by the electronic cash register or EPOS, which is responsible for unlocking the device, opening a new receipt and accepting a transaction. Um, the truth is you can find locked point of interaction devices um, unattended almost everywhere. And people just give them around and expect you to um, um, you know, not tamper with them because they're just sitting there. Um, and the truth is that those locked POIs can be unlocked within a few seconds. <coughs> so until recently, it was so much easier because um, the successful transactions that you were performing when you were buying stuff, when you were performing any transaction, it would be sent back to the acquirer after 24 hours. Um, and clearing the transaction scars <coughs> was just a few clicks away. You could basically make a transaction and um, clear it from the device. So it was never being sent back to the acquirer. What people tend to do when micro-criminals find out, especially in the US, they were going into a shop buying a really nice, huge TV, and they were going back to the shop afterwards, removing the, the POI, and they would start running. And that was it. That was the crime of the day. <laughs> right? It's, it's micro-crime, but it works. Um, since last year, almost last year, maybe a little more, um, successful transactions now are sent back in real time. What we mean is every three, three minutes. Not from the time that you do the transaction, but in three minutes intervals. So we don't know if you have like one second or two minutes 59. Um, clearing the transaction cost is now protected by a secure code. It's like a pin. And when I started doing this research uh, on these systems, like almost four years ago, um, there wasn't a secure code there. There wasn't a pin there. So when I raised that, that was the first issue that I raised when I was working for one of the US manufacturers. I said, this is so easy to do. I mean, anyone, the moment someone released that, the moment someone says that, to, you know, publicly, everybody's going to do it. So from my understanding is that they took this report, they went back to whoever they had to go back. And now, after discussions, um, all these machines have been uh, updated with a secure code, so you cannot actually do that. However, as we said earlier on, the lock devices can be unlocked with 7 to 10 seconds. So by passing those restrictions. <coughs> um, so these are a few ways um, to never pay again for a transaction, because you could actually do that if you were very dedicated. Um, one of the ways to do that is basically to um, hack into the internal network. If you hack into the internal network, let's say of a small merchant, um, you could send commands to the POI uh, because the communication from the ECR to the POI is basically um, plain text. So you could open, close the current receipt, open a new one, change the amount, and complete the payment. So once you hacked into the network, 
you could, if you have enough information on what to tamper with, with the protocol, basically change the amount. So from a thousand pounds, you could pay 10 and go. Um, pay as normal, but instead of trying to clear the cache, you could remove the OS completely with a quick key combination. So devices, that's what I'm saying, that this is the threat modeling. The devices out there, they have secret key combinations that very few people know about. So instead, now they have protected the cache with a secure code, but there is a secret key combination for each device that you could completely remove the OS from the device, which means the um, transactions will be lost. If you want an example, I can go to buy a 4K TV. I want a 60 inch, right? So I get, well, I'm not gonna do it, I'm just explaining that how it could be done, right? <laughs> or I'm not advising you by any means to go and do that. So imagine me getting my friend Sam with me and we go to a computer store, I don't know, computer world, um, and I want a 60 inch 4K, the most expensive OLED TV there, there is, like, and my car basically can afford that. So I walk in, get the, the TV, I give it to Sam and say, Sam, please pay for it and don't worry about it. And I'm next in line with a mouse or a clicker, right? Sam pays for the TV, he gets a receipt, everything is perfect. I'm next in line, it's like a few seconds only. I want to buy this clicker. So I'm supposed to put my card in and pay. The moment that I put my card in to pay, basically I can completely remove the OS from the system. So he paid, he got a receipt, the transaction never reached the acquire. You see where I'm going with this? And I say, oh, it broke. Never mind, here you are. And walk away. And that's it. I got this, we just got a TV for free, basically. Um, there are tricks that you could do if you play around with the systems. Okay, again, every OS manufacturer has different paths to do these things, but imagine that um, if you want to delete the OS, for example, um, it's like four key combinations for a specific manufacturer. But you need to know the combination, basically, and the, um, how to do it. The um, communication between the ECR and the point, when, the, point, uh, the point of interaction, the POI device, as I said, it's uh, not encrypted. So if you start tampering with it, you will end up finding out um, what kind of commands to send. Again, this is an example, right? So you can try to do, do this at home or anywhere else. Um, another interesting bit about payments is that there are transaction types. So when you buy something, basically is usually is transaction um, zero zero. That's it. Um, when you get a refund, it's zero four. Um, there's something else which is called pre-off, which is basically when you go to a hotel, they ask you for your credit card or your yeah your credit card. They swipe it. They make sure that um, they have your details and you can afford to pay for that room, and they haven't charged you anything. And the charge will happen when you're about to um, leave when you check out. And there's also something which is called Quasicas and something which is called um, game winning credits. But before I go there, there is also a transaction time which is called balance and query, right? So technically, you could find a card and see what's the balance in that card in the account connected to it. Um, Quasicas, this is very interesting. Um, this is when you go to a casino, and this is where Las Vegas comes in. <laughs> You're smiling very intensively. <laughs> um, you go to the casino, basically, you give them your card, and you say, I want 100 pounds in chips. They give you those 100 pounds. So that's a transaction time for 13. Right? I'm trying to be brief here. Um, in that case, you can go to the roulette, win a million pounds, Go back, well, you're in the US, right? You know, it's a million dollars. Go back to the cashier and say, oh, I want this. Please give it to me. So they will do like a 14 type of transaction to give you the winnings. Great. You know, will you, if you are the acquirer, how are you going to check if that is true or not? Because, you know, the said so. It's their um, responsibility. You'll see where I'm going with this in a second. So let's go see some and a, a couple of tricks that you could do if you know the systems or if you play around with them. Um, 
you do know that um, we do tip and pin in the UK, but other places in the world, you just sign for um, whatever you want to buy, right? You know that? Yes. Um, so imagine someone who understands how this system works and wants to take advantage of this by making, by forcing the device to switch into signature mode, basically. In this case, while someone presents you the device so you can enter your card, you can follow a few steps, force the device to go into signature mode, and pay with your card by signing it, which means if you found the card, you'll pay with someone else's card. Am I right? Yes? And the only thing that um, you need to do, basically, is to um, scribble whatever scribble is behind the card. Another um, cool trick, which I'm not going to go into details in, in many of the satellites, but you know, just keep an open imagination, is to enter the card upside down. So when you go to pay, and you're willing to do that, you enter the card upside down, the point of interaction thinks that your chip is not working anymore. So it will ask you um, two more times, and basically ask you to swipe the card. Um, it will do a fallback, and basically will complete the transaction so you won't have to sign anything uh, most of the time. Sometimes it will ask for a signature, but not all the time. So do you see where I'm going with this? You know, you fool, you, you, you fool the device um, that your card is not working. And there are a couple of tricks to do, so you don't have to put your card upside down. So just open, you know, have an open imagination so people do this. Uh, another thing is one of these devices. Have you, has anyone seen one of these devices before? Yeah, well, obviously. <laughs> um, so these devices are jammers. So when you go, you, you, you need to know your target, basically. So you, you go in there, you jump the communication between the device to the base. So the device can knock, um, speak to it. That's it. Once the device cannot speak to it because it wants to do a transaction, and it takes, you know, takes up on the risk, basically. Um, it will try twice, and then it will give you a proceed code um, in order to um, phone the bank and um, basically ask um, if that transaction is supposed to be done. And they will give you a code to type into the device. If you're quick enough, um, and you have an American Express card, while I was researching this, I found out that it will continue if you enter any two digits, which is quite impressive. And if your card is not an American Express, it will continue if you enter any number that confirms the LAN algorithm. So you can remember one of those by heart if you want. Um, which is very uh, feasible way of doing fraud. Um, and then you can basically clear the OS as well, if you know how to do the trick. So this is, sounds like micro fraud, but um, um, we're demonstrating that even though the system have been thought about, there are standards, there are documentations. If you start thinking like the attackers, and thinking that the attackers will start having access to them, you need to think ahead of the game. <clears throat> you can find an unintended post. As I said, there's a key combination, you can unlock it. Once it's unlocked, you have full access to the menu. Uh, you can basically enter your card and request a refund to be sent to your card. I'm not going to explain the whole process, but you get the idea. Um, now, if we go back to the gambling winnings, imagine if you are capable to combine all these things, and instead of getting a refund, you're getting gambling winnings. Don't do it at Tesco, there is no point, right? But imagine doing it in Las Vegas in, at the casino. Mark a, transa uh, mark, um, a transaction back to the, your card as as that you want this amount. See? Yes? <clears throat> During a normal payment um, state, when the POI is unlocked, there's another cool trick where you can pull your card out for two millimeters. And you can, while you do that, you, know, you can chart with the merchant. Wait for six seconds, because this is what the standard says for the machine to reset. Um, you press menu, usually, because it's there. You press a couple of keys, and basically you change the amount that you want to pay. You push the card in, and you give back the post. Uh, trust me, no one looks at the amount. They only want to uh, ensure that there is a statement that says 
the transaction has been verified. That's it. Uh, and you need to smile. Mm -hmm. And they don't look at the receipts, basically. <coughs> Assuming that you are an existing merchant. So imagine that you have a shop, you are a merchant, and you want to be devious. Or you're doing that in purpose now. Basically, what you do, you get your device, instead of tampering with it or with anyone else, you can go into a shop and replace their device with yours. Simple as that. People have done that. It's not very common to see it, but people have done that. Once you replace a device, basically every transaction they make goes into your bank account. <laughs> Simple as that. Um, obviously, you need con artist skills, and you're going to go in for white collar crime, but you see where I'm getting with this. Um, no one checks when they should. Well, not every, at every transaction, obviously, because, but they don't need to leave uh, the device unattended. No one checks the serial numbers when they close shop um, in the night. Contactless. All the above applies, basically. Um, you can use any of the above tricks. There is a limit of 30 pounds, not in all countries, again. Um, another trick is that when you, um, you cannot have two cards being, well, one card being read by two devices at the same time, but if you go to a pub, they sometimes, some of the merchants, what they do, they say, well, you, you have the barman basically, and they say, oh yeah, it's like 10 pounds, and give me your card and I'll tap it, you know, it's right there. Have you ever had that? Has any, I've had it a few times, right? So they turn around and say, Look, it's right there. Look, I'm going to do this and I'm going to give you the card back. Um, I've tested. It's very easy to do this. Instead of doing beep and giving it back, you can do beep, 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 beep. And the, next, the other devices are basically uh, hmm? next to it or under it. You can leave a card on a table and charge it. Right? It's so easy. And... When I was doing um, this presentation behind closed doors, um, I had to do. I was trying to explain this in the most easy ways possible. Um, I don't want to do that because we're on the, <laughs> on the streaming now. But imagine having a device um, in your pants, basically, and dance around in the dance floor at a night. <laughs> You're going to get so many beeps, and no one will know why you're so happy that night. <laughs> How many people take pictures and they put their cards online? Have you ever looked at that? Right? These are Twitter hashtags. There we are. Ten minutes. What do you want to buy? So easy. Uh, this guy is very good, actually. He covered, he used, um, whatever that is. He used, he covered up that, those two digits, that digit, and that digit. Um, I know because of the light, you cannot actually see it on the, on the screen right now, but as you all know, down here is the same number as up here always. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was right there. Um, so, so many examples. I, I don't want to go into detail, but there you are. And this is someone who wanted a, an article. So he, this is actually the card of the guy who wrote the article, I think. So there you are. It's like the, his real card there. This magical red line covers all the numbers. I don't know, maybe, you know, making you not be able to see that. This is a two, this is a zero, this is a nine. Um, credit cards, credit cards, um, yeah. This guy bought a laptop uh, with someone else's card. Um, front and back. Um, cards, cards. You get so much information about these cards, basically, online, that you can do really funky stuff if you start collecting information. This is a scribble here. That's a signature, right? And I don't know what is more horrifying in this picture, if it's that signature or that nape of <laughs> <laughs> um, Again, cards. I can go on for days. Um, this is a very interesting example, basically. Well, this is what I was going with it. If you want a card, some people will put their hand and they will take a picture. Um, what I did, I made a little program that regenerates the missing digits. Based on information like that, these are Wells Fargo, it's a Visa debit. So basically, that number, half of the number is missing. I know that the number that is actually missing 
because of those details here. So that's her number there. That's not that important. It is like to you. Um, you want more cards? McDumbles. I'm swiping it. That's the road. <laughs> I know. Pretty good. Um, dark web. You go there. You want a credit card? There you are. So you don't have to do all these numbers and expose yourself. You can you can go click cards and do it. It's so easy. As long as you think and you put all this information together. Um, writing a memory scrapping POS malware, right? We've seen those. We've seen them being around. Why p do criminals write POS um, memory scrapping POS malware? I think because it's the easiest thing to do because they don't know that they can do something else at the moment because they don't have their hands on live devices. Go getting a device from eBay is not the same thing as having a live device connected to the backend for many, many reasons. And, you know, but being here in the world, we know why that is. Um, let's see then <clears throat> what is happening. Virtual terminals. You know, we've talked about those devices, but there are also software applications that they do almost the same thing. Um, virtual terminals are provided by the payment ecosystem, such as the acquirer, the payment service providers, and more. Virtual terminals, um, compared to the POI, can work without the POI connected to it. Difference between ECR, EPOS, and DVT, the ECR does not work without a POI connected to it. You can actually key in the card details in DVT. You can on the um, POS as well, on the POI as well, but that's another story. Um, VT software needs to be PA DSS compliant according to the payment card industry. Uh, that's a PA payment uh, applications um, data security standard. While the ECR is only being checked if it stores card cardholder data. <coughs> that's a very interesting, uh, very interesting thing. That is a lot of work to be done there. <coughs> the main objective is to identify if it's possible to get your hands on the cardholder data when you're penetrating Pen, pen testing basically um, for PADSS compliance. So you do like SQLI and other type of injections, you do buffer overflows, you check the cryptographic storage, you check the insecure communications and improper end role handling. What I do, when a system is PADSS, everything is fine. You won't find any vulnerabilities. But if you do threat modeling from an attacker's point of view, from a hacker's point of view, you start identifying things that you can go around, combine things together and you, you, you start finding out other routes to exploit the system in a different way. So threat modeling, it's assessing basically the logic of the virtual terminal in this case, and look into the payment process from a malicious merchant's perspective. And I'm saying merchant within quotes because that merchant is supposed to be a potential malicious person who has access to it or he got one somehow with fake details or things like that. It's a repeatable process to find and address all threats to your products, right? The earlier you can start, the better, with more time to plan and fix. You must identify the problems when there is still time to fix them before the SIP day, because we've seen products in the market which have vulnerabilities and they have been just sick because they reach their day to be released, basically, and they cannot hold them back. Um, Third-party components and software development lifecycle. There is a lot of work done, again, from all of us on third-party components and how to do threat models on those. Um, uh, it's, it's a very interesting, um, some, a couple of very interesting white papers online. The end goal is to deliver more secure products. So, um, when I was playing with the devices at some point, um, I found out that it's possible to modify the configuration files. Um, again, I'm supposed to be a really bad guy, right, for this, right? I'm not actually a bad guy. Um, I'm a bad merchant. I'm, I'm a, someone that tries um, to take advantage of the systems. So, someone gave me um, a system to take payments and I'm trying to, to play with it. So, you can basically tamper with the configuration files. It, won't, it wouldn't stop me at that point. And one of the easiest things to do was to change what you see on the screen with my Twitter handle. Um, have you ever had one of these? Have you ever used one of these devices? Yes. Um, sorry? 
Um, allegedly, they have been updated. I haven't tested the new version. The old version um, did not look for signed firmware. So basically, while you were there, you could tamper with it. You could load different firmware and basically do whatever you want. You can send the payment whatever you want. Those things connect with a vid, uh, via Bluetooth, uh, powered over USB. The interesting thing about these, though, is that they come with a different parent key, which is really good. However, the parent key is a serial number at the back. <laughs> so the whole security is that. If you don't want to spend time um, brute forcing the, the, uh, the parent key. <coughs> How do they distinguish between merchants? Well, obviously that we are in world pay. Um, you know this answer. That's why I changed it to it's BT has identifiers. Um, based on those identifiers, payments are settled against the correct merchant. So imagine now that someone wants to edit those identifiers. So editing those, however, messes with the encryption key, which means it messes with the encryption header, which means if you tamper with it, it will stop accepting. Um, you will not be able to accept payments. So based on the fact that I was able to tamper with the configuration files, that's so in this case, um, that's why you are able to tamper with those um, identifiers. And um, how, did, uh, how can we overcome that? Well, an alternative scenario for Paul Smallware in this case. Thinking outside the box, let's make a stop. We've seen post malware propagating uh, and taking over so many systems, because, and they are targeting the credit card numbers, the card holder data. Internet shoppers are expected to spend about 750 million pounds on Boxing Day. So, in order to think a different scenario, what you will need in this case, a valid merchant ID. You can actually use fake details to get one. It will take a couple of two years to just be established, but you could do it. So it's like thinking in the future. It's not about crime that you can do the next day. Um, you need first year programming skills, basically. Know how to cover your tracks. Think outside the box. Focus on the money, not the credit card numbers. And have attended this presentation. <laughs> and please, make sure you have an, always an escape plan. Yeah? Otherwise, you're going to get caught. Again, this is the funny point of view. I'm not advising you that you should do that, right? I'm not telling you that you should do that. I'm trying to get you prepared to anticipate such crime, online crime. Um, you could create and spread malware on Boxing Day. Or you could create malware and spread it that does nothing. And it activates itself only on Boxing Day. Right? You change the identifiers, you mess up the, the, encrypt, the, the encrypted header. You delete the encrypted header file. This is where it comes, where AppSec comes, developers. They will build redundancy into their systems. So the application will rebuild the new encrypted header with the new identifiers. So basically, you've just changed it to whatever you wanted to. And then you need to cover your tracks. This is where digital forensics comes in. Change the identifiers to what it was, delete the encrypted header files, clean the log file, and reboot the PT application. Um, the only way to prove what you've done, it's months of forensics work. Spreading undetectable malware for that kind of scenario, it's basically easier than one might think, especially when you're targeting, um, when you're spreading something that is not going to do or have any malicious code in it <coughs> when you're trying to spread it. I'll explain what I mean when we're offline. You um, activate it on Boxing Day or on Black Friday, simply wait for the money to be settled to your bank account. You're gonna do crime that it will be, 
you're gonna do crime like that's, that is 24 48 hours of crime and you need to get into a plane and go in this case but it's a scenario there are turnless twists there are limitations I know I'm not going into details for obvious reasons but it's another scenario it's thinking outside the box when it comes to um, assessing this kind of security if the VT is written in the Java and this is really cool um, Get the post into asking to key in the card. End of the account number and normal, add 70 year to your expiration date. <laughs> or alter the VT days by adding 70 years um, in the system. Target the, 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 the date on the system, where, where the VT reads the date from, basically. Uh, and perform the transaction as you like. Anyone has an idea why um, this is an attack scenario? Sorry? Yes. Um, it is strict. Yeah, it is, sorry. It is strict, the system is strict that the transaction took place in 1985. It's backdated, basically, because of the lifespan of computers, the dates within the computers. That, I found that, let's say, accidentally. And it was really cool. And the reason why it was really cool, because I've actually made a transaction. And I said, can you please find it? And they couldn't. I had to tell them <laughs> how I did it. And that was so always awesome. It was it 1985? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, that was so cool. I wasn't expecting it to work. Especially w doing the second thing, which is even easier than the first one. Because basically, I'm targeting with this potential malware, the date on the system. That's it, nothing else. Um, conclusions. Security is an ongoing process and the payment can industry enforces compliance for a good reason, right? So, uh, in these cases, you need to start thinking about how you could exploit this kind of systems, basically, in a different way. Um, cyber criminals are not better than you there is a big misconception that these guys are cool and they do that and they're great and they're hackers and sure they know technology but you saw what happened with WannaCry it was an opportunism basically right we all agree on that everybody was I was well no everybody I was I've started reading about it uh, I don't know Friday afternoon I think Friday <laughs> evening um, and everybody was panicking over the weekend. So many articles on LinkedIn, on Twitter, uh, things like that. Um, how are you copying? You know, the NHS is hacked and everything, and the data is encrypted, so now they're secure, basically. Um, <laughs> did I say that? No, I didn't. <laughs> um, and they asked me, oh, how was your Monday? Is it like a stressful week? Yeah, but definitely not because of one cry. Right? It's another day in the office because, you know, if you're doing it right, if you'd have advice and make sure that people are doing it right, it was nothing. It wasn't something, but yes, there are systems that they need to be secured. There are systems, there are legacy systems, and there are, you need to take other steps. You need to protect the surroundings. This is where it comes. This is where threat modeling comes again. Um, it is easier to break things than fix stuff. Another thing. Um, it needs a security mindset to keep things secure. Yeah. Anyone can go get an, uh, an exploit that was released by an agency and tries it. But, you know, it gets real talent, and you have those talents available to yourself to protect your systems from these opportunists, basically. Cybercrime does pay. Uh, I think it's like, what, 50 grand with uh, what I cry by now? Something like that. I mean, all this disruption for 50 grand. I mean, yeah, whatever. Um, but until you get caught, and they will get caught. And you know why they will get caught? Because things are changing, right? Yeah, they cannot know it all. They cannot protect from everything. Technology is changing. We are changing the way that we think and the way that we used to do things. That's why we are in this room right now. And that's why we have the OASP Summit with all this, as very um, uh, correctly, um, sorry to mention, that like all these minds sit together in a room trying to do it the best way possible. If you break the law, you are going to get caught, basically. And that's because technology is changing faster than it used to, and uh, it won't be long until um, they find a way to get to you and protect those systems. That's the important thing. 
uh, one last set of tips, especially because we are in Europe, uh, educate your merchants. They definitely, not, not yours, I mean for all our clients, for every uh, merchant out there, make sure that they don't leave those devices in the tender. Make sure that those networks are secure. Think outside the, the scope in this case. And you know what I mean by that. Uh, give them good advice. It's very interesting that um, some people, they say, uh, these are simple merchants and basically they don't know how to do these things, how to protect the systems. If you know how to pay in bitcoins when you're being infected by a WannaCry, then you could basically update your, 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 your OS, right? You could basically install an antivirus, you understand that. Don't tell me that you, you did that. I mean, if, I was, if it was my mom, definitely I know that she doesn't have a clue about how to get bitcoins and pay in bitcoins, for example. Um, stay um, ahead of cyber criminals. Consider such scenarios. This is a very um, important meeting in this case, right? Because we're sharing ideas. This is very important. That's how you consider the scenarios, by networking, educating ourselves. Every day we learn a new thing. Uh, sharing information. Ensure that you're disobeyed and you can recognize such fraudulent activity in real time. And that's a very important key issue here, the real time. How do you do that? Well, security operation centers and all that stuff need to be applied, need to be taken under consideration. Machine learning is coming really fast, basically. Um, consider threat modeling exercises from different perspectives, different kind of. Um, if you didn't know, and you want it to be very, very secure for, with your debit card. If you demagnetize your mag stripe, it won't go into the ATM. Did you know that? How many people knew that? Yes. It won't go into the ATM. Uh, credit card is better, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's weird life. <laughs> um, if you can remember your CVV, you know, the little number behind, uh, if you scrap it if you, and you lose your card, that is actually a really dodgy, I don't know, it's obscurity, it's not security, but it works. Because you're hiding a very important piece of information, especially if you have magnetized your card, right? And there is no other data in, the, in track one, two, or three. Um, don't put a photo of your card online, obviously, <laughs> right? Please don't do that. Um, and use RFID block sleeves wallets and cards. The little sleeves that you put your card inside so you know no one can read it in the um, tube or when I go to clubs and start dancing next to you, you know. Um, yeah, protect your RFID um, uh, cards. And um, having said that, we are ready to go shopping. Yeah. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope you find the second time you Thank you very much, Greg. I think it's time for questions now, and uh, well, because I'm the chapter leader, um, I'm going to have the honor of asking the very first question. Okay. Of course, you said about the RFID blockers, we actually have quite a lot of them, which are cards, uh, outside, right, provided by our sponsors. So you put one in your pocket, and then uh, it will not be possible to um, scan your card anymore using the contactless reader when you dance next to someone who yeah. just touched their back pocket. Yeah. Okay, but the question is, I remember you, uh, you talked about the serial numbers at the back of post terminals. So I know it's security by obscurity, but you can probably, there's a question, if you put the sticker with your company logo at the back of the post terminal, it is, is that any better? Is that any better? Um, it is something, it's taking steps. It's not the ultimate um, way to stop fraudulent activity, but you don't have that, um, you don't have it um, accessible to everybody. That's it. Yeah. Um, I assume that you didn't cover it, so did you do any threat modeling on reprogramming the chip in your card to be able to attack the device? No, I haven't touched the, um, the actual chip, and that because it was completely beyond that. Um, I haven't, that's, what, that's a completely different field, yeah. But I did, what I did, I tried to, um, well, I did intercept the communication between the RFID card to the um, POI. I have uh, seen someone reprogram their card 
So it has um, an Oyster card on it, credit card and a debit card. And when they're presented, the, it talks to the, the uh, device and it asks him how does he want to pay. I suggest you should pardon that. <laughs> Uh, just in relation to the gentleman's question, MWR have done some interesting research on that, reprogramming the card. Uh, so, for example, on some vulnerable terminals, you can play games by inserting your card. So look on the website if you want details. Questions? No? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Oh, one more, one more, one more, Dennis. Okay. So... Uh, you clearly have done a, a, a lot of tread models, right, around uh, car payments and systems. Can you try to anonymize some of those diagrams and some of that data and publish it? Because I, I did a lot of reinvention of the wheel. I had somebody who very recently did a thread model on a payment system. It still kills me that we always start from scratch. Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Greg. Thank you. Okay, we, we have a break, and uh, let's have a five to ten minute break, and then we'll continue with a second break. Yes, this is, oh yeah, which reminds me, I might need to turn this off. <laughs> 